All right, so this is going to be our lecture video on hair and fiber analysis in the forensic science lab. So we're going to be looking at a lot of different things in this. Um, we're going to analyze the layers, growing stages, and scale patterns of human hair. We're going to look at um, identification and comparison of hairs and fibers, understand what the microscopic characteristics are of um, human hair in terms of racial origin and body location, look at the microscopic characteristics of animal hair in terms of their scale patterns, and then identify microscopic characteristics of natural and man-made fibers. And so we're going to break that up into individual sections. So a notorious case where hair and fiber analysis was critical in solving the crime was in 1979 to 1981. Um, 29 people, mostly children, were strangled by a serial killer in Atlanta, Georgia. They staked out a lake where the bodies had been dumped, and they arrested a suspect on circumstantial evidence probable cause. But what really uh, led to them getting the confession they needed was that they found carpet fibers from Wayne Williams' home um, matched on the bodies, uh, one of the recently dumped bodies that they were able to recover. Uh, out of the lake he was dumping them in. And so by matching uh, the carpet fibers, fibers and also um, some animal hair from his dog, they were able to convict him of the crimes. So hair and fiber is another form of trace evidence and it's often transferred in between victims and suspects when they come into contact or between either victims or suspects and objects at a crime scene. So you can prove contact between the victim and the suspect or place the victim or suspect at the scene based on the hair and fiber evidence. And so we mostly are analyzing hair and fiber underneath a microscope. Um, from the microscopic examination of hairs and fibers, we can either conclude that the question sample and the known exemplar match. They likely originated from the same source or we can say they do not match and they cannot be matched to the same source. Or you can say that there are some similarities and some differences so that you can not reach a definitive conclusion as to whether or not they are from the same source. So it's a yes and no or a maybe. Looking at hair, um, you can tell the color of the person's hair. You can take a guess at their race. You can tell if it's been dyed. You can try to give a baseline um, from a suspect. So if their hair shows up somewhere, they can try to match it. You can link somebody to a crime scene. In order to do all this, you need to analyze the hair from root to tip, so along the entire length of the hair. And the longer the hair you have, the more discriminatory it becomes because the longer hairs have more uh, variable characteristics along its length. Analyzing fibers, you can see the different microscope characteristics between the natural and the man-made fibers and, and in between the natural and man-made fibers. You can also see if a question fiber matches a known source. You can see if you have question fibers from up from one place matching question fibers from another place to see if they came from the same source. Um, Hair and fiber is one of the few things in forensics that can serve as solid scientific proof. So without this kind of evidence, forensic scientists would have a hard time solving crimes. So hair samples can be examined to, you're going to look at the color of the hair, the shape of the hair. You can analyze its chemical composition, and you can often determine the race of the individual, which is valuable for including or excluding people from the investigation. You would do this with either a compound microscope or a comparison microscope. Um, human hair cannot be attributed to a particular source, so it's not discriminatory enough to provide an origin of the hair, but you can use it to exclude people from the investigation. Chemically analyzing the hair, you can use extraction methods and then run it through something like GCMS and you can detect drug use or heavy metal toxicity or if they have certain nutritional deficiencies. 
The only way you can get DNA from a hair is if you have the intact root with a skin tag on the end of it, um, which is not always going to be the case. You only really see that if the hair was pulled forcibly and it was an active growth stage. Um, but you can also analyze the hair to see if it was shed after death or post-mortem. And the post-mortem hair has a dark spot on the root that they call banding. So your hair protrudes from a follicle in your skin. Um, the root is embedded in the skin and then the shaft of the hair protrudes above the surface of the skin. The shaft is dead and keratinized, um, it has keratin and some binding materials. So it's um, similar to horn, but not quite as hard. There are three layers to a hair. You have the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. The medulla is the innermost layer of the hair, and it's usually air-filled. Um, you only really see medulla present in large, thick hairs. Um, so some hairs may not have a medulla, and in some hairs it may be fragmented. The cortex is the middle layer of the hair that has the pigment in it, and it can be used to determine if it's a human or an animal hair you're looking at. And then the cuticle is the outermost hair layer of the hair it is transparent and it's scaly and we have different patterns to the scales and by those different patterns we can differentiate human or animal uh, species so the basic three patterns are coronal spinous and imbricate coronal means crown like so it's shaped like a crown or it looks like a bunch of cups stacked on each other you see it very often in small rodents and dogs and very Rarely you find it in human hair. So that'd be the one in the picture in the middle. The second scale pattern is spinous, which looks like triangular petals that are overlapping each other. You never see this scale pattern in humans, but you do see it very often in cats. And then imbricate is a bunch of overlapping scales. So it's like all in a very overlapping mesh pattern. You see this very often in human hair and not very often anywhere else. You can look at the hair and look at the root particularly to try to determine the growth stage that it was uh, pulled or shed in. Um, antigen stage, the root is fat and bulbous and ha still has a blood supply. Um, this is the active growth stage, lasts between two and five years. Catagen stage is a transition phase where it's detaching from the root and blood supply and being getting ready to be shed, which lasts about two to three weeks. So the bulb is narrower, but not flattened yet. And then in telogen phase is where your hair is going to fall out naturally and a new hair is going to start growing in its place. So here the root is very narrow and uh, almost the same as the rest of the length of the hair. Um, then that phase lasts between two and four months. If we're going to get DNA from a hair, you need the root and you need it intact and you need a layer of biological cells around the root, so a skin tag. So you will only get that if the hair has been pulled forcibly in antigen phase. When you have suspected hairs in the forensics lab, the first thing you're going to need to determine is if it's if it is hair. And so you're going to look at it underneath a microscope for the cuticle, medulla, and pigment. Um, then you're going to differentiate if it's human or animal hair by looking at the size and appearance of the medulla, the scale pattern, and the diameter of the shaft. Um, so under the microscope, you're going to look at the medulla pigmentation of the cortex and the types of scales in the cuticle. And then you can also use other specialized techniques to look at different aspects of the hair. To get the scale pattern on the cuticle, you use a scale cast, um, which is especially useful for identifying human hair. And then uh, you would classify the scale pattern as either coronal, spinous, and imbricate. Um, Human hair, again, being most often imbricate, sometimes coronal. There is an advanced technique in the forensics lab to prepare these for casting using something called thermoplastic slides, which will melt around the hair um, when they're heated to a certain temperature, and then the hair can be removed to be cross-sectioned, um, but the scale cast will remain. 
a cheap and dirty method of doing it is to put some clear nail polish down on a slide, put the hair in, and then pull it out carefully after the nail polish dries or becomes tacky. To cross-section the hair, they're going to put it in between um, some polyethylene uh, plastic wrap and melt it around that and then they're going to make very very thin cuts crosswise across the hair and mount that in a liquid um, and cover it with a glass to view under the microscope. The cross section gives us a lot of information about what part of the body it comes from or the race of the person that the hair came from or even the type of animal it comes from. Um, in determining the racial origin of the person using the hair, you're going to look at the pigment, the cuticle thickness, the diameter of the hair, its cross-section shape, and its degree of wave or curl. This is very useful if you have not identified a suspect yet. One thing to remember is that these this data only considers people that are of one race. So if you have someone that has more than one racial origin, then their hairs are going to be a mixture of the characteristics. So one of the main elements that we look at for racial origin is cross-section shape of the hair. African-American hair is very, very deeply pigmented and has a coarse clustering of pigment granules, and they're usually very tightly curled. So their cross-sectional shape is elliptical and flattened. Caucasian hair has a medium pigment density, and it's usually very variable. Um, also has a very variable degree of curl and the variable diameter of hairs. But their cross-section is oval. And then Asian hairs are also very deeply pigmented and they have a very thick cuticle and a very prominent medulla to their hair. So their hair is very, very straight and has a round cross-section. And so here's an example. So this is an East Asian hair, so it is uh, very, very thickly pigmented. The medulla is very prominent, and this is a very round cross-section. Caucasian hair, again, is more ovular. The pigmentation varies, the diameter varies, and then African-American hair is also very deeply pigmented, and it's very, very elliptical in shape and very curly. You can determine by looking at the hair also if it has been forcibly pulled, damaged by being burned, or it has been chemically treated. Um, in terms of determining where from the body the hair came from, human head hairs are the most likely to be damaged or cut. They're also usually much longer than your body hairs and more likely to have been altered. Head hairs and pubic hairs have a greater range of microscope characteristics when compared to hairs on the other parts of the body. So these are the most often uh, examined. Pubic hair um, usually has a very coarse diameter. And one of the characteristics of pubic hair is what we call buckling, which is this twist in the hair, which is why pubic hairs are so curly. Limb hairs are usually a very fine diameter um, and they have an arc-like overall appearance. The tip is usually very tapered or blunted or braided because they rub up against your clothes and so it's worn down. And they're usually very soft. Facial hairs are very coarse and they usually have irregular or triangular cross sections because we trim our beards and mustaches. They usually have a very broad and continuous medulla, and they may have a double medulla, but they're usually very stiff in texture. Chest hairs have a moderate and variable shaft diameter, but the tips are often very dark in color. They are very fine, and they have, they're arced in their gross appearance. They may have what's called a granular medulla, which means it looks grainy, and they're usually very stiff. Underarm hair, look like pubic hair a bit, but there's a lot less buckling with underarm hair, um, and their medulla is more similar to limb hairs, and they usually have a very fine tip. And then other hairs on the body, like eyebrow and eyelash hairs, are usually very stubby and short with a saber-like appearance. Trunk hairs are somewhere in between limb and pubic hairs, so they're considered a transitional hair. Um, and your eyebrow and eyelash hairs are usually some of the darkest hairs on the body. 
Um, you can also run across animal hairs a lot in forensic examination because it could be somebody has a pet. It could be they have a pelt or a fur in clothing, or they may have wild or game animal hairs because they hunt or collect uh, trophies. In terms of differentiating them from human hairs, the color is usually uniform in human hairs. Animals have variable colors in their hair samples. Um, scale patterns in humans is usually imbricate. Animals can present any of the three types and a mixture of the three types in the same sample. Pigment granules in the cortex of human hairs are usually even, but animals, the pigment granules tend to cluster around the medulla. The medulla of the animal hair can make up two thirds of the width of the hair. Human hairs, it's less than one third. And then with human hairs, the medulla can also be absent or fragmented. And with animals, it's usually continuous. Um, deer hair is one unique thing in terms of their scale shape. They have what's called an isodiametric scale pattern, which is unique to deer. Um, but you can also differentiate domestic animal hair by looking at the root structure and scale structure and pigmentation. So again, if we look at this, um, you can see this is a human hair with its, with a fragmented medulla. This is a dog hair, um, with a uh, continuous medulla and tell the medulla is much thick, much wider in comparison to the shaft. This is a deer hair, um, rabbit hair. The medulla is almost the whole width of the shaft. Cat hair um, has this bubble like appearance. Um, and again, the medulla is almost the whole width of the shaft. And then mouse hair is uh, also very unique in terms of its appearance. When looking at uh, the root of the hair, you can take a guess at the species that the hair came from. So for example, cats have this characteristic paintbrush bristle shaped root and dogs have this shovel shaped root. So when we're examining uh, animal hair, it is very important to examine the whole hair from the root to the tip. Um, <clears throat> The tips of the animal of human hair are blunt from cutting and styling. Animal hair is more likely to be uniform in shape and size. Animal hair is also usually more regularly arranged than human hair. Um, but the real problem with animal hairs is that in a given sample, they vary a lot in the given animal. So you have to have a large sample size to get a good comparison. Fibers are another element that can place a suspect at a crime scene, um, but they can also look a lot like hair. So it is very important to examine them thoroughly to determine if they're animal, if they're hair or their fibers. Textile fibers are divided into either natural fibers or man-made. Natural have either an animal, vegetable, or mineral origin, such as cotton, hemp, wool, or silk. Man-made fibers can be synthesized, synthetic or regenerated fibers, so they're made in a lab or made in a commercial mill. Um, cotton fibers are the most common natural fiber produced in textiles and has a very characteristic ribbon structure underneath the microscope. Linen is a less common uh, vegetable fiber. Linen is a very expensive uh, fiber to use in clothing, so it gives significant evidence if you find linen fibers at the crime scene. They have a characteristic X mark or perpendicular mark across the length of the fiber, which is how you differentiate them. The most commonly used animal fiber is wool. Wool has a lot of different uses. You can use it for clothing if it's fine or coarse uh, is, made, is made into carpets. So you would identify wool using a scale pattern. And so if we look at, these are some examples of fibers underneath the microscope. So this is a very coarse wool. This would be used for carpet. This is a very fine wool. This would be used for clothing. Um, this is also alpaca wool and, and cashmere. So it's very similar. Um, but notice that they all have a coronal scale pattern. So that would tell you that this was an animal uh, fiber. Silk, um, this is silk, which is another animal fiber. It's made out of silkworms. Um, this is linen, and there's that characteristic perpendicular mark. Here's cotton with its ribbon structure. And then polyester, which is a synthetic fiber. You notice it's very regular all the way up and down. It's very uniform. 
So synthetic fibers are made from synthetic polymers, um, include nylon, polyester, and acrylics. You can find them in clothing, in car uh, curtains, fishing lines, pantyhose. Um, and their characteristic appearance is they're very smooth and uniformly dyed, and they may have dark spots to increase their opacity, meaning they're thicker. Um, you cannot use a bright field microscope to distinguish the fibers. You have to use a polarized light microscope to distinguish them. It lets you see their internal structure because of their refractive indexes, their optical pro properties. So if you engage a double polarization filter with acrylic fibers, they will be white or gray because their re two refractive indexes are very close together. So they have a very low birefringence. Nylon will glow bright underneath double, uh, double polarization. So uh, double polarization is very useful to differentiate um, synthetic fibers. Uh, the round polyesters also have very large variances in their optical properties. So using double polarization uh, microscopes will help you determine what kind of fiber you have. Um, microscope examination is a fast method to start grouping fibers into types, and then you can follow it up with some sort of spectroscopy to confirm what type of fiber you've got. Another interesting thing about fiber examination is wig hairs are often submitted as hair evidence, um, but wig hairs are synthetic fibers. And so this is a good example of why it's important to look at it underneath a microscope first to avoid unnecessary tests. So if we look at a wig hair underneath a microscope, you will see um, like no medulla. And then if you tried double polarization, you would see uh, the characteristic bands of color on the length of the hair that is not common to polyester. So then you would know it is a synthetic fiber and you would refer it for infrared spectroscopy rather than trying to refer it for DNA or something else, some sort of chemical analysis. You may also uh, look at the cross section shape and figure out that it's not the right shape for the color hair you've got. So then you would probably know that it's something synthetic. So when we're looking at the fibers, you're going to look at the composition of the fiber, its overall appearance, the physical properties, its shape, and any unique identifying features such as the ribbon shape or the crosshatch markings or the scale patterns.